Hi, detectives. I'm Margul Fump. This is a review for Who Censored Roger Rabbit. It's a novel written in 1981 by Gary Wolfe. It's famously been made into a movie. It was a very, very good movie. But this is the original book, and uh, it's got a lot of changes. You know, the movie does not follow the book so much. It follows like half the book is what I would say. Um, and I say that because it's a double murder. This is a murder mystery, but there are two murders, whereas in the movie, there's only just one. It only has the one murder. So that's a, that's a pretty big change. The other big change is that uh, um, this book focuses on newspaper cartoon characters, whereas the movie focuses on like animated cartoon characters, like the Great Mouse Detective, or Mickey Mouse, or Bugs Bunny, uh, Donald Duck, those sort of characters, whereas this, more uh, newspaper comic strip characters. So, you know, Dick Tracy, Garfield, uh, Archie and Jughead, uh, Beetle Bailey, characters like those. So that that's sort of a big change. They also change the time period. You're like, uh, this technically takes place in the 80s, you know, the same year the book was published. But uh, it, it doesn't feel right in places. It does feel more like it's a 1940s story because it's very much a noir murder mystery. We've got our hard-boiled detective, Eddie Valiant, who's uh, hard-boiled, he's hard-drinking, and, you know, he's always getting mean to suspects and cracking wise in his narration. He's a narrator. And there, there are a couple of places where I didn't like him being so mean, but I understand that. That's just part of the genre is generally when you have a hard-boiled detective, he, he's kind of mean to everybody. And, you know, he's also kind of falling in love with all these femme fatales. Um, there's especially a big one, Roger's wife, uh, Jessica. So the, a lot of the characters are the same in this. Uh, let me talk about this title. Who censored Roger Rabbit? I don't like that title. I would have gone with Who Framed Roger Rabbit because that's you know, that's the title of the, the movie. That's a much better title. But I also would have gone with Who Killed Roger Rabbit. Because Roger dies in this book. That's the mystery. Yeah, it's actually a double murder. Um, so, uh, the first murder is basically the one that you see in the movie, right? Roger's boss is this big uh, guy in the cartoon world. Um, it's the DeGreasy brothers. So, Rocco and Dominic DeGreasy, that's who they are. And this book and uh Rocco is kind of got a kind of a sleazy guy got this thing going on with Roger's wife Jessica and his wife is just this most beautiful woman who's always trying to seduce everyone and it's clear she's got like a secret hidden agenda and uh you know Eddie Eddie Valiant he, he, he tries not to fall for her but he he can't help it he knows she's playing him like a cheap violin but uh, she's just so seductive, you know. Anyway, so uh, we, we kind of go into that, that, uh, you know, Roger's boss is kind of, you know, playing patty cake with Roger's wife. Now, in, in the movie, they are literally playing patty cake. But uh, he, here in the book, it's a, it's a bit more than that. Uh, Jessica has given up on Roger. She says she doesn't want to be married to him anymore. And she's living with Roger's boss now. She just moved out. In fact, they got married under odd circumstances to begin with. Um, I like this kind of small detail that Roger proposed to Jessica on her first on their first date, just sort of as a joke. And she said yes, and they went to Reno and they got married. And I, I like to think hey, maybe that's true of the movie. Maybe Roger and Jessica did get married on their first date. Anyway, uh, it's weird because she used to be dating uh, his boss, right? And then after that, uh, you know. Roger got his big contract to be a, a comic strip star. Uh, he's still the second fiddle. He's not the main star, right? Baby Herman is the star of the cartoon. And Roger's kind of mad about that. So he's had a, had a big blow up with his boss over whether or not he should get his own comic strip. And that's how this book starts, is uh, Roger's trying to hire Eddie to investigate, hey, what's going on with my boss? Like he said he would give me my own strip. He broke his promise. And now my wife's living with this dude? What's going on? Yeah, so Jessica, that's the start of the book. That's that's sort of the mystery that propels Eddie to meet all the various characters. Uh, there is one more character who's, like, not in the movie, and it's basically, uh, 
I wouldn't say the cartoonist, but it's this woman who she takes the pictures of the cartoons for the newspaper comic strip that Roger Rabbit appears in. All right. So, uh, I mean, partway through, it turns into a double murder mystery, right? Uh, the boss gets killed. Everybody thinks Roger Rabbit did it. Um, and Eddie investigates. People are lying, which, again, is typical for, like, a film noir story. And uh, he, he finds out Jessica's got this really seedy background. So she appeared in some adult cartoons, like a, an eight-page adult cartoon, shot by a guy named Sid Sleazy. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, so, uh, you know, apparently there's, there's like, behind-the-scenes hush money, and that's why everybody's sort of lying and trying to cover stuff up, is, um, you know, the, the boss who was killed managed to get his hands on a copy of this dirty comic starring Jessica Rabbit. And, and uh, the, the guy, so the Sid Sleazy, he had a meeting with the, the big boss the night the boss was killed. And so he's a potential suspect, too. And, you know, it's possible that Jessica was the one who killed it because she wanted to get her hands on the original photographs to completely destroy them. So, the, you know, when I phrase it that way, it does sound a little bit like the movie that we've got incriminating photographs, uh, photographs that make Jessica Rabbit look bad. And maybe she is guilty. Maybe she was trying to get her hands on those photographs. Uh, it quickly becomes apparent that the MacGuffin is a tea kettle. Everybody wants this tea kettle that Roger stole from the set of Alice in Wonderland. Roger played like a beagle in that movie. Another like, just like a side thing, which I thought was interesting is Roger complains that, oh man, Bugs Bunny was super hot that year. Bugs got all the rabbit rolls after he won his Oscar. And so uh, Bugs Bunny played the March Hare in Alice in Wonderland. And that's interesting that the March Hare is actually Bugs Bunny. It's like, whoa, that's that's mind-blowing. But I, I thought it was just a cute joke that Roger's like, Ugh, I always see Bugs in auditions, and he always gets the role because he's more famous than me. It's not fair, Eddie. It ain't fair. Um... Uh, Roger is really annoying in this book. He's also kind of annoying in the movie, so it, th that fits, that fits. And as I said, they've got the same basic story going on with, uh, Roger's wife, Jessica, who's just, who's, who is a very, very gorgeous woman who could almost pass for a human. Almost, almost. A, there, there's a couple of things that humanoid cartoons can do to try to make themselves appear uh, more human. So I, I thought that was interesting, too. But uh, they did clean it up a little bit for the movie. In the movie, it's just pictures of her playing patty cake as opposed to, like, actual adult content. Okay. So, let me move on to the next part of the, the mystery. Um, okay, so the boss was killed, right? So, like an hour later, Roger gets knocked off. Roger gets killed in his home, and it's a very... There's a very high-tech alarm system in the home that only he and Jessica can uh, manage to open. And uh, someone stole the major tea kettle. Uh, the big tea kettle that everybody wants to get their hands on. And, I don't know if I should go into spoiler territory, but, like, one of the characters who doesn't care about the tea kettle just sort of picked it up uh, by accident. <laughs> That's what happened. But uh, that, that character lies about visiting Roger on that night. Feels like everybody's lying about who was where and when. Uh, we know the victim made two phone calls the night he was killed, and so, uh, you know, people are lying about that. Uh, the victim's son, uh, Little Rock is what he's called, he's sort of involved in the mystery, too. Um... It ties back with the uh, photographer who takes the pictures of the comic strips. Um, they were working... Okay, I am getting into spoiler territory here. They were working with Sid Sleazy to try, like, duplicate these uh, comic strips and sell them as originals. And that that's sort of the deal that was going on, a lot of double-crossing. So, victim's son and employee were sort of double-crossing with the Sleazy guy who tried to double-double-cross them with the big boss to get them in trouble. You know, whole complicated mess, right? So that was going on. I like how Eddie puts it towards the end of the book. He's like, well, you didn't know that half the town was apparently visiting the victim that night when you went to see him, Roger. That sort of thing. Um, anyway, Roger's murdered. And I, this brings us to, like, the two reasons why I think this was done, why the characters are newspaper cartoons as opposed to being, like, animated cartoon characters. 
So, uh, number one, the newspaper cartoon characters, they have like thought bubbles that come out of their head, speech bubbles that come out of their head. So uh, Roger's speech bubble is found underneath his dead body. So it contains his last words. And that's interesting, right? We get to know what the victim's last words were. Um, we, we don't know any of the anything else that was said uh, in the room before the victim was killed. But that that's an interesting uh, twist, which you can do because he's a newspaper comic strip character. Something that just popped in my head. Baby Herman, who kind of plays a big role in the movie, kind of not. He's barely in this. He, he's just there at the start of the investigation when um, Eddie's looking into, it's like, okay, did the boss actually promise uh, Roger his spinoff uh, cartoon? And, and Baby Herman's there. So he, he interviews Baby Herman as part of that investigation. The very start of the book. So he's just a one chapter character, but he's basically the exact same in, in the book and in the movie. All right, so where was I? Um, second reason I think that this was done as a cartoon, yeah, as a newspaper cartoon, is because he invented something called doppelgangers. So the cartoons basically can create a duplicate, which survives usually for about five minutes or so, whenever they have to do like a dangerous gag. So, you know, Roger needs to get an anvil jumped on his head. He just makes a duplicate, duplicates gets the anvil dropped on its head, and then the duplicate disintegrates within five minutes, just goes right back into Roger. So it, it, it is well set up in advance, because Jessica even makes makes a duplicate um, in, in this first part of the book where we're setting up the world and explaining how things work. So um, what happens is Roger's killed, and then Roger's duplicate, or doppelganger is what they call it, doppel, so his doppel shows up, and his doppel is a really, really strong one. Not a, not your typical five-minute one. This was a really, really strong one, which will be around for two days. Be around for two days, because Roger made him to go out to buy suspenders uh, around the time of the murder. But then he comes back, um, sees the crime scene, realizes, oh no, the actual me got killed. What'll I do? I'm going to disappear in two days. And he really wants to be a private eye and help Eddie... So I thought that was interesting, and I feel like that's probably a reason why, uh, maybe the main reason why the author came to the idea of using cartoon characters is like, this way we can have the murder victim hanging around after the murder. And that's a, that's what's really different and interesting about this book. Uh, that's, that's what I feel is like the more interesting thing. Uh, the idea of cartoons living in the real world that's also kind of interesting, and then they, they do some interesting stuff with that. But I think the main one is that Roger Rabbit was killed, but he's still hanging around for a while. Um, I guess something you could say is, you know, like in the movie where the weasels die and you see their little angels flying up to heaven, and the angels stick around, not for very long, just for like, uh, you know, 20 seconds at most. Think of it like that. We've got Angel Roger hanging around for two days, and that gives us a ticking clock, too, because it's, it's two days before he disappears and this murder mystery can't be solved ever again. I mean, I guess it could be solved. Um, uh, there's no Judge Doom, um, who is a major character in the movie, um, but he's not in the book. So I feel like that was probably... It probably made the, the movie better to have the Judge Doom character, because that movie gets a lot more interesting once he shows up and the pace picks up. And uh, we don't see anything at Toontown in this book, which uh, is kind of a shame because that's a really cool part of the movie, but uh, not in the book. All right, so he goes around trying to solve the mystery. It's basically, it's a, it's a film noir. So he bounces around from character to character. Everybody seems to be lying and having some sort of secret. I already talked about, you know, there's a secret scandal with Jessica Sheedy past. And then there's a secret scandal with people selling fake uh, comics as originals and that sort of thing. And Roger, seem, <laughs> Roger seems to be wanting to help the case, but also a screwball. So he keeps screwing up the case. And... Can I get into spoiler territory? Gonna get to the spoiler here. So here's the big uh, plot twist at the end. So the tea kettle that everybody wants is... <laughs> it's actually a Persian lamp with a cartoon genie inside. And if you say, like, the magic words, the genie pops up. And the magic words just happen to be uh, the last line of when you wish upon a star. May your dreams come true. May your wish come true. One of those lines. And uh, so Roger 
accident. <laughs> he had no idea it was a magic lamp. And so he used it accidentally without knowing it. And so that's how, A, his first wish was getting that big job. Um, but the genie was mean and said, oh, ho, ho, you'll get a big cartoon job, but you're going to play second fiddle to baby Herman. <laughs> um, his second big wish was to have Jessica Rabbit fall in love with him. And that's why out of the blue, she dumped her boss and then uh, married Roger and was in love with him for a year. But again, the tricky genie is like, ah, ha, ha, I'm only going to make it last for a year, see? And uh, once the year is up, her, her brain just sort of changed and now she's gone right back to her old boyfriend, the big boss. And Roger had no idea that was the case. And so who killed Roger Rabbit? It was the genie. Genie just decided to kill him instead of, like, giving him a third wish. Genie just pulled out a gun and, and, and shot him. Yeah, kind of a strange ending. The genie talked, uh, genie talked in, like, fake old-fashioned stuff. You know, instead of saying, I'm looking out for number one, he says, I'm looking out for Roman numeral one. You know, stuff like that. It was actually kind of interesting the way the genie talked. But I, I can see why they... Oh, yeah, the, the end of the movie, a uh, big plot twist that the villain was actually a tune in disguise. We have that in this book. So the, uh, the boss who was killed, him and his brother were actually tunes in disguise. They used two wishes on the genie. Uh, wish number one was, you know, for them to become humans instead of remaining as cartoon characters. Wish number two was that they could become this fabulous, you know, they could become fabulously wealthy running this cartoon studio. Also, only Toons can wish on the Toon Genie. That's just the way it works. So, um, what Eddie does is he grabs the Genie and basically forces the Genie to give him one wish, which is, you know, he wishes for proof that, uh, the, that, um, gosh, what's his face? Is the culprit. I'm sorry. That DeGreasy's culprit. He, he basically wishes, he gets a suicide note from DeGreasy that says, hey, I killed Roger and then I killed myself. So now everybody is, now Roger and Jessica are off the hook. It was kind of interesting, though, that, uh, gosh, I totally forgot to mention, Jessica is the prime suspect for Roger's murder. And, you know, that's sort of a big deal. It's like, okay, how did the two murders combine? Do they have the same murderer? We've got uh, different motives. Everybody seems to hate Roger, so lots of different people could have killed Roger. Not as many people hated the cartoon boss. So, um... Yeah, that's something the book go, goes into. We, we have to investigate both murders. But yeah, it looks like Roger got framed for the boss's murder, and Jessica insists she's been framed for Roger's murder, which is kind of the case. I don't think the genie was actively trying to frame her, but anyway, so we... <laughs> Eddie basically just wishes, hey, I wish the case was solved. And he gets a magical suicide note, which solves everything. So now Roger and Jessica are both cleared. Neither of them are framed for murder. And we get a last minute plot twist, very last minute plot twist, that uh, Roger was the one who killed the boss. He was, he, he was the culprit. That's why he went, put so much energy into making a doppelganger that lasted for two days, was because uh, he wanted an alibi because he knew he was going to commit murder. But as Eddie said, he didn't know everybody and their grandma would be visiting the victim at the same time, and somebody was plotting to kill Roger that exact same night. Uh, so just, just bad luck uh, of timing on Roger's part. So Roger is the culprit, so it's not who framed Roger Rabbit. Roger did, in fact, commit that first murder. Uh, with the second murder, though, he was totally framed. Um, uh, no, that wasn't it. Huh? Yeah, no, Jessica Rabbit was the one who was framed for Roger's murder. So that's why I would call this book Who Killed Roger Rabbit instead of Who Censored Roger Rabbit. Because if you call it Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it's kind of unfair because, uh, well, he did end up being the culprit in this one. All right. So that's what I think about this book. I thought it was an interesting book. It was okay. I liked seeing the differences from the movie, and there, there are a couple of little things I liked as well. Wasn't a huge fan of Mr. Valiant. Uh, or Eddie Valiant, uh, the, the main character, the, the main narrator. I thought he was too gruff and mean at points. Um, but maybe that, that, that was just me. Uh, excellent book. You can see why they wanted to make it into a movie. Also could see why they decided to make lots of changes for the movie. And I'm told there are like three different sequels. 
which immediately pretend this book doesn't exist, and they say, nope, nope, it's the movie. This book was a dream. This was a weird dream that Jessica had, and uh, the movie is, is definitely the version that that was, is reality, and that totally makes sense. More people are familiar with the movie than with the book. So, yeah, it kind of makes me wish I wrote, like, a mystery in this style. If I could come up with something like the uh, the doppelganger, like the excuse that's like, hey, this is a reason why Roger is still around even though he's already been killed. And I could see that with AI. That would be a story, right? Somebody saved their brain to AI. And so that way I'm able to talk to them a little bit even though they've already been killed. Maybe something like that. Like, maybe that could be the premise for a, a good uh, mystery. Anyway, so those are my thoughts on Who Censored Roger Rabbit? A mystery by Gary Wolf. Maybe I'll read the other books in the series. Maybe I won't. Bye.